A lot of areas in the south and the west are suffering from heat, but fortunately we appear to be clear of tropical cyclone activity. Let's take a look at our climate indicators. The only significant one is the Pacific North American Oscillation. That's up in positive territory, and that's indicative of that ridging in western Canada and some of the heat that we're seeing in the Pacific Northwest. A quick look at the evening sky, looking out to the west. This is going to be one of the last couple of weeks to see Mars very low on the horizon just after sunset. It's going to appear distinctly reddish. Also to the northwest, the Big Dipper, located right there. And you can use that to find Polaris, the North Star. You take the part of the Big Dipper where you would pour that out, and you draw a line radiating out to the north, and that will locate the North Star itself. You can see that's right there on the northern horizon. Also, there's been a buzz on social media over the past few evenings, people spotting the Starlink satellites moving across the sky right around dusk. I don't know if that'll be visible tonight, but that may be worth checking out just in case. Taking a look at the weather around the U.S. this Friday afternoon, well, we see lows and highs and fronts. Let's try taking a look at this a little bit differently. The, the way that a, a meteorologist would see things. And the way we do that is looking at the air masses. So how do we find the air masses? Well, we use the fronts as boundaries. In other words, here we have one air mass across Texas. We have another air mass across the Midwest and part of the Northeast. And another even colder air mass moving across Ontario into the eastern Great Lakes. And another air mass in the southwestern deserts right there. That is all so-called continental tropical air, also known as dry desert air. Dew points are in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and temperatures are quite warm, especially in the lower elevations. And we can see that where we have a difference between the air masses, we have some enhanced weather, some upper level support, some jet stream activity. In fact, we can even surmise that the jet stream is somewhere right in there. Is that true? Well, that does seem to be the case at 500 millibars, about 30 knot jet right there, stronger jet well up north, and that's associated with this stuff in Canada. Once we go up to 200 millibars though, it all kind of joins together in one large jet stream. And yeah, look there at uh, California. Very strong subtropical jet coming on shore. That is not associated with the front. In fact, at 700 millibars, very weak flow. As we mentioned, there is a frontal system moving through New York, the center of the low right there near Watertown. And there's the AWIPS display showing numerous Severe storms moving through the Albany area and southern Vermont and southern New Hampshire. The surface front located right up there, that's going to be the surface low. The warm front extending southeast, maybe maybe just north of Boston actually. And the cold front, that's a little bit more clearly indicated. You can see the northwesterly flow in the wake of that cold front and some very humid southwesterly flow in advance, helping to feed this activity through the Alpine area. And not surprisingly, SPC has a slight risk out from about Harrisburg up to Concord, New Hampshire, and with that, a couple of severe thunderstorm watches. And as we mentioned, we've also got a cold front through the Carolinas into Alabama and Mississippi. And there has been enough support for an MCS, which is moving through southern Alabama at this hour. You can see that even out to the west, an outflow boundary extends out to the Mississippi River. And look at that, 102 at Jackson, Mississippi, 101 along the Mississippi River itself, and close to 100 at New Orleans. That's certainly some unusually hot weather. Here's a place that is very acquainted with very hot weather. This is probably the 20 or 25th day of 100 degree temperatures in many of these regions. 103 at DFW at this hour, 100 at Houston, 102 at San Antonio. So I don't really see an end to this. It's going to continue at least 
for another week. Some of that heat extending all the way up into southern Kansas, though, does kind of become mild as you go north. And I've got the reflectivity on here. This is very good for finding boundaries. I don't really see anything notable in here, but when you're expecting a slight chance of storms or better, this is a very good product to be looking at. The reflectivity paired with the surface data. Checking in on Arizona, yeah, it's very hot. 111 at Phoenix, 104 at Tucson, and 105 at Yuma. However, as you go north, it does get a little bit milder. In fact, I probably could have drawn a weak decaying front somewhere in this area right there. You do see the support in the thickness field, little gradient of thickness contours, and temperatures in the 70s, which is fairly mild for this time of year. Heading out into the Pacific, oceanic high, little low pressure area about 500, 700 miles offshore. And as we go north into Alaska, this is fairly early in the day there, but they are getting 70s and low 80s. And some red flag advisories have been popping up in the southeastern Alaskan interior right there. You can see the smoke. Temperatures up in the 80s with winds up to 25 miles an hour. Very favorable fire weather conditions. And some of that favorable weather that they've had in the Northwest Territories for wildfires that's been going on for weeks, that appears to be creeping westward. Also up in northern Canada, a strong frontal system, and that's affected some warm air from the interior, up to 75 at Pelly Bay. I think at last check it was 77. Yeah, they're still hanging on to 77 degrees up there, and this is part of the distant early warning line. It's been renamed to North Warning System, I think. But the dew line, that's been a very famous Cold War icon. And right there, yeah, that's the high Arctic, and they are getting some very inclement weather. Is that a record? Well, we can head off to Wikipedia for a look, and the highest that they've ever seen, 84.2. And they typically should be seeing 50 this time of year. And heading down into Canada itself, another weather system going through Manitoba and Quebec. It seems like every time I pull up the map, there's a big weather system going through the middle of Quebec. It's happening again. Temperatures up in the 70s as far north as Labrador and a little backdoor front in the northern part of that territory. Well, heading back to social media, weather has been in the news. Some very hot weather in South America and I've seen some other headlines in Korea and other places. Let's take a look exactly what's going on. This is a temperature anomaly map showing where conditions are very hot. You can definitely see there in North America, Texas and Oklahoma, they are getting some heat, northern plains as well, and especially up in the Arctic. Again, this is yesterday, and Alaska has been pretty warm as well. But in South America, Temperatures have been up in the 90s around Paraguay and northern Argentina. Europe has been looking pretty cool, so some places are very pleasant right now. But northern Russia, especially up there in the Arctic, yeah, that's very troubling to see. Siberia itself looking rather cool, except for a few localized areas, but the heat has been a factor in China, Japan, Korea, and well into the Asian interior. And looks like Australia has not been left out either. Temperatures above normal, and I've heard some comments that temperatures have been up in the 70s in some of the cities there in Australia when they should be seeing much cooler temperatures. I guess we can't forget Africa. Our tropical weather does come from Western Africa. But it's interesting to look at, and looks like it has been rather hot through the central part of the continent, and not so much in the highlands of the southeast. Anyway, that's something different. So let's take a look at the forecast, and we're going to look at pivotal weather. I don't have the AWIPS charts because there was a server outage earlier today. So on AWIPS, I can only show you the radar data, surface data, and stuff like that. So let's look at pivotal weather. And one way we can break this down, I mean, if we look at this, it's kind of hard to pick out the changes that we're seeing. So what you can do is you can look at today's data and just kind of make a couple notes. 
anticyclone over southeast Texas, anticyclone over El Paso, ridging through the central U.S., a little low. We're not going to worry too much about the small-scale stuff. Yeah, a couple lows. And a big low. We'll definitely take note of that in Quebec. So these are the systems we want to kind of monitor that and maybe the ridging in British Columbia. So let's just jump ahead five days to midweek. Okay, so there's Wednesday. What has changed? Well, we still see the ridging in southwest Texas, maybe shifted a little bit towards the Big Bend. The troughing in Quebec is gone. It's been replaced by some other smaller scale troughing in Minnesota and Manitoba and some more troughing. That's been a big change right there in the British Columbia region. So that's going to take us out of that PNA pattern. And what we see here off the coast of California, there's a little disturbance coming up from the south. This is a northward drifting tropical storm or maybe the remnants of a tropical storm. And you can see that there's this very strong southerly flow coming up into California. That's going to bring up tropical moisture into that area, some high surf as well, and a definite change to the pattern in the southern part of the state. So that will bear monitoring over the next five or six days. If we take it forward, this is very indeterminate. Very likely there's going to be changes between now and then, but by Thursday, looks like the circulation is moving onshore into California somewhere. We could see significant changes to that forecast. We could see a drift into Arizona, or we could see a drift more out to sea. So we don't really know right now. Let's take it another five days into Sunday, which is getting way out there. But you can see that there's not much of a change in the pattern in Texas, Arizona, maybe a little bit of a southerly flow that may bring the monsoon back once again in Arizona. Maybe another round of activity there. And then we see the Canadian region reverting to a trough east and a ridge west, although some fairly fast flow across the Western Canadian region that will help support maybe some lee side troughing there in Alberta. Maybe some severe weather chances going up in that part of the continent. And there's one more thing worth showing you. Let's take a look at those fronts again from the Carolinas to the Texas Panhandle, Kansas, and that other one in the Northeast. Let's look at potential temperature. That's taken all these temperature values and we're reducing it to sea level. So there you go. This is in degrees Celsius, so near sea level, that's going to equal the surface temperature. But out there in the western U.S. where you're 4,000, 5,000 feet above sea level, you're going to get some very high values, like 47 Celsius. That's going to be close to about 115 Fahrenheit. And what that's telling us that if this area was completely flat and there were no topographic interactions, we would see a huge desert all the way into Colorado and Wyoming and Kansas. Again, we're kind of ignoring the effects of the mountain ranges, but that does show you that it is quite dry in the interior. And the reason that temperatures are only in the 70s and 80s in Colorado is because of the altitude. So the warmest air mass right now is actually in New Mexico, and that's helping to support that upper level high that we have in that region. So all that stuff is kind of tied together. We also see the boundaries. That's going to be the front. Looks like it, the structure is a little more complicated. There's one little front right there, another little front probably in here. So that's the kind of thing you want to take to the surface chart and resolve. And there's another little boundary right there. Some of that's going to be flow from the Great Lakes, cooling things down behind that cold front. But it looks like there may be a warm front along the Appalachians, kind of like that. So it's entirely possible I could have placed this warm front maybe down here. And I do see support in the thickness field. There's a couple lines right there. So, yeah, if I was to reanalyze this chart once again, I probably would take that warm front a little further south, I think. I do see that the air mass goes from 73 at New York we get out of that rain, that's rain-cooled air, we take that up to New Brunswick, 73. Pretty similar, although it's more humid down south. 
So it's very, very puzzling. I'm not really sure where exactly that warm front would be. That would require a little bit more analysis. And that's the reason the analysis process is so fun and challenging. Every day is different. It's kind of like a puzzle that you put together. No two puzzles are ever the same. One last look at the weather in the Northeast before we close things up. Numerous severe thunderstorm warnings. I don't see any tornado warnings on any of these cells, but they are fairly numerous all the way through Albany and up to Portland, Maine. And no tornado reports today, although through the Appalachians there. Hail reports, wind damage, pretty much in that same area we were looking at. So thankfully not looking at much in the way of tornado risk. And I'll leave you with a little bit of footage from January 11th of 2021. Snow in Texas. That would be amazing right now. I want to thank our newest Patreon supporter, Eddie Holmes. Thank you very much for your support. We'll see the supporters back here on Monday and everybody else on Wednesday. Hope you have a great evening and a great weekend. Take care. Bye-bye.